Uh, my name is Troy Lanigan, uh, president of the Canada Strong and Free Network. I want to welcome uh, everyone to November's exchange call. First and foremost, we couldn't do these without sponsorship. So a very special thank you to our sponsor, uh, the Modern Miracle Network. A couple of quick housekeeping matters. Uh, first of all, we are going to let the chat uh, function run today. The usual reminder that anyone posting rude or objectionable comments, we will, uh, we will obviously remove you. Um, the chat is for commentary and networking. Uh, if you have a question for our panelists today, please put it into the Q&A box. And we have uh, Colin Craig from secondstreet.org who's joining us today, who's going to be monitoring the uh, Q&A box. And uh, we'll be going to him later uh, in the hour for uh, questions about some of the things that you'd like to ask our panelists. Um, if you have suggestions on future topics, please connect through our website, or you can email me uh, directly, uh, Troy at canadastrongandfree.network. I'll ask Zoe to put that email address up into the chat. Finally, this Zoom call will be recorded and posted to our website two hours after uh, the call. Uh, with that, I'm going to welcome our panelists and thank them for sharing their time uh, with us today. Jack Mintz is with the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. The Honorable Joe Oliver is former federal finance minister, former federal natural resource minister, and most important of all, he is a board member uh, of the Canada Strong and Free Network, and we, we thank Joe for that. And finally, Franco, last but not least, Franco Terrazano, Federal Director of the Canadian uh, Taxpayers Federation. Okay, so we're all through our introductions. Let's jump into today's topic. Lots to uh, unpack, obviously. I'm going to start with uh, Jack Mintz. Um, Jack, we're going to talk about, and we'll certainly get into the disruption that, that COVID has brought about uh, to the economy. But I think maybe as a starting point, we'll go back and discuss where Canada was at before COVID. What were some of the, the fault lines? What were some of the things that you and others were talking about as far as economic policy uh, in the country goes in 2019 that obviously would become disproportionately more concerning once the pandemic uh, arrived here? Well, thank you very much, uh, Troy, for inviting me, uh, and I'm happy to participate in in today's panel, especially to be uh, with my friends Franco and uh, and Jill. Um, let me uh, uh, first of all uh, begin saying that you know I've written a lot about uh, this topic uh, many times in the in the Financial Post uh, with regard to Canada's economic performance, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic. And there were some uh, very significant weaknesses. I think the, the biggest one, of course, was uh, our declining per capita uh, economic growth uh, since 2015. Um, in fact, as I pointed out, uh, if you don't include 2020, just look at the period 2015 to 2019, per capita economic growth was roughly a half percentage point. Uh, that was well down from any other period, except for the 1990s, which was actually one of the worst decades we ever had in per capita economic growth, which was also about a half a point uh, for a five-year period um, uh, during that time. And so, uh, and so uh, we had basically gone back to uh, really uh, one of the worst periods that we had in, uh, since the Second World War in terms of economic growth, uh, even, even before the pandemic hit. Uh, now, if you add 2020 in, which obviously was uh, a rather rude awakening for everybody. Uh, our per capita economic growth actually became negative uh, for a five-year period from uh, 2015 to including 2020. And that's the first time that it became negative since the depression uh, for a five-year period. So uh, we were already suffering, I think, uh, before the pandemic from very gro uh, bad growth. And of course, the pandemic uh, just made it even worse. When you start looking at some of the various aspects of uh, things that contribute to growth, for example, uh, investment, business investment, which I've written about many times, not only did it fall relative to GDP uh, over that period, but actually it fell in real, in real dollars. Once you take out inflation, the amount of business investment actually declined uh, from 2015 to 2019. Then obviously when you add in 2020, that just accelerated the, the problem. Uh, residential investment did rise during that period. In fact, that was the only good news on investment uh, was residential investment because people were buying homes and, and they were building new homes. So that part was, was positive, uh, but 
when it comes to business investment, which you need to produce goods and uh, services in the future, uh, we were really lacking. And of course that undermines the productivity and that exemplifies the fact that our productivity uh, during that whole period of 2015 to 2019 was a return to the worst decade that we have. In fact, when I do mention the 1990s, uh, I'd like to remind people that actually we had the fourth lowest productivity uh, as, a, as an OECD country during that period, uh, as uh, work that was shown by uh, Pierre Fortin during that time. Then of course, there's other things that have been, that affect our growth. And, and one thing I'd like to mention is education. Uh, we're starting to slip on education. Uh, we're seeing this in the PISA tests that come out of the OECD. Uh, one time we were doing fabulously well. We were one of the top countries when it came to math, uh, sciences and, and, um, and, uh, and English uh, or uh, French, you know, in, in terms of language skills. Uh, we're slipping actually in, in, those con in those areas. And that's something also to watch out for because the pandemic also hurt education quite a bit. And, and so I think we're coming out of the pandemic at a time where we really need to address these economic growth issues. So why, why is economic growth problematic leading up to here? What, what are the factors that have led to, um, to, to those lower amounts, investment dropping in particular? What are the policies? Well, I think it's, it's various things. I mean, uh, we've had, um, you know, we've had uh, policies, particularly on the regulatory side, that have discouraged investment. You know, it's it's well known amongst many Canadians, but even internationally, that Canada has a very tough time getting anything built in this country. Uh, and 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 it's not just pipelines, which of course uh, tends to be the headliner on a lot of these issues. And that obviously is related to uh, the federal government that has uh, tried to stop oil and gas development to a large extent uh, through the reg regulations, such as Bill C-69 and Bill C-48, the tanker ban. Um, but, uh, but it goes well beyond that. Uh, I talk to people that are in the condo building world. I talk to people that are trying to build commercial, um, uh, commercial real estate, uh, things like that. And they'll all tell you how slow it is to get things done. In fact, uh, someone near Ca uh, Calgary told me the story about, about how they were uh, going to be exporting canola to, to, uh, Asia may, you know, and wanted just to build a major facility in order to hold the canola for export. And it took, and it took years to try to get a permit uh, from, from a municipality. It wasn't Calgary, it was, it was near Calgary. Uh, this is the sort of thing that is really holding Canada back very badly, is, our, is really a very intrusive government uh, that is uh, undermining it. And then at the same time, we've been hiking, not so much corporate tax rates, but personal tax rates. Uh, and that has, uh, ha that has, of course, a negative impact of growth. It's been shown in a lot of various studies, but it particularly uh, undermines the innovators in the economy uh, because once you start raising personal tax rates, as we have since 2015, uh, the, both the federal government and the provinces, uh, then that has also undermined uh, the economic growth in, in, in the country. Okay, so Jack, let's switch now to uh, COVID now having set in as we head into to 2020. Talk about some of the uh, key policy prescriptions that Canada employed and maybe explain a little bit about the difference between the fiscal and monetary tools. The, the prime minister doesn't think much about monetary policy as we know, but, but it's important. And, and I think it's leading to, we'll probably talk a bit about inflation later. Uh, as well, and and talk about how Canada's maybe fared relative to other countries that have had to deal with the same uh, the same situation. Well, I think first of all, uh, during the pandemic, um, there was an attempt by almost every country around the world to try to uh, try to reduce the impact of the pandemic on on the economy. Uh, people were told to stay home. Uh, people uh, couldn't earn a living, or they had reduced hours of work. Uh, they uh, you know, there was certainly a major decline in employment income uh, during that period. And uh, what many governments did was spend money transfers to try to uh, buttress the impact of, of the recession. Uh, but also in a sense, you could say that it was appropriate to do so because people were basically locked down. They were told to stop doing things. And in a sense, this was compensation uh, for, uh, for aggressive uh, laws that were taken on at that time. Uh, that were needed to, to deal with the situation. Now, um, 
not all countries though uh, gave so much in government transfers that uh, that actually um, uh, led to an increase in household income, not a reduction in household income during recession. Uh, but Canada was one of those. In fact, Canada increased household income through government transfers that more than offset the loss in employment income by by uh, by uh, uh, hundred uh, by ten percent. In other words, people had 10% more personal income uh, uh, during the pandemic period than they had previously because of the size of those government transfers. The only country that actually spent more than us was the United States, so not at the beginning, but later on when all their packages have come through. And in fact, the US is still spending a lot of money with two new packages that, that are running through the system. Uh, if you look at the European countries like Germany, for example, they didn't do that. They kept household income about par, um, you know, prior to the uh, pandemic and during the pandemic, and and so they didn't splurge as much as as uh, the Canadian government did, and and as uh, and as the uh, as the American government did. In fact, we were quite unique in that sense, and and I've I've been trying to argue this point that we were too generous in our plans, and and in fact we didn't take enough care uh, to try to minimize their costs, especially after the first few months. Uh, when at a later time we had a chance to revise the programs and do that. Now that what's happened, of course, is that people have money to spend. Um, and with the supply shortages, and we have to remember this was a supply shock that hit the economy with the pandemic. People were told to stop working. They had stoppages of work and everything else. This is a supply shock. And what we had uh, with all the government spending, of course, and uh, accumulated savings is we're now facing inflation. Uh, because there is more money and, and uh, for people to demand goods and services relative to the available supply. And, and of course, that's happening even more so in the United States compared to Canada, where the U.S. Uh, Consumer Price Index has risen now 6.2% uh, as of the end of October. Ours is about 4.7%, still quite high, much higher than, than the past. And so that leads, I think, to a uh, question of monetary policy. We did have, uh, because of the very large deficits, huge amounts of uh, money that effectively was printed by the, um, by the Bank of Canada, but initially held in chartered bank reserves and not relent to the market. So therefore not initially causing an inflationary environment. But money supply has uh, sharply increased over the past year. And of course, uh, that money could easily be uh, moved around. And I think that's where we're going to be now into a position uh, in the future where we're going to have to deal with this excessive uh, amount of savings that is now being spent uh, and, uh, and the amount of government spending, uh, still significantly large government deficits, uh, and, and potential for more printing of money uh, if, uh, if the government continues to uh, to try to get the Bank of Canada to hold those bonds, which the Bank of Canada will not do now. In fact, they are going to be stop. Uh, they'll be stopping the purchase of treasury, treasuries, uh, and that's going to force the uh, Canadian government to go out to the market uh, to raise money to uh, finance its goods and services, which could then eventually lead to pressure on interest rates. In my view, um, we're going to jump off on. Uh your reference to spending and deficits and talk now to Franco Terrazano from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. I thought Franco would actually start out with a bit of an intro because The Economist magazine just came out um, over the weekend. The, the title on it is The Triumph of Big Government. I thought I would just read the, the summary of, of the title story. Governments have spent 17 trillion on the pandemic, including loans and guarantees for a combined total of 16% of global GDP. On current forecast, government spending will be, will be greater as a share of GDP in 2026 than it was in 20, 2006 in every major advanced economy. Even government slayers like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher were a blip in the long running upward trend. There are bad reasons for this, including pork barrel politics and bureaucratic empire building. But part of the explanation is the inescapable fact that prices of the services welfare states provide, such as healthcare and education, grow faster than the economy. and most important, government is getting bigger because voters want more, better education and healthcare, spending on the elderly, aging population, and action on climate change. So I looked in preparing for this, Franco, uh, spending federally, $17,000 per person in 2021, 
42% higher than the recession in 2019 and 65% adjusted higher than in World War II. Uh, so the question to you is, how realistic are these spending levels? What permanent changes to the size of government uh, do you anticipate? And some of the dreams that these politicians talk about, universal basic incomes, nationalization of, of, day, of uh, care homes, dental coverage, it just never seems to end. So that's the task of you and your organization. So, so where's the jumping off point on some of these, on these issues? Yeah, and we certainly have our work caught up for us, hey? I mean, these, these spending levels, even just right now, before the massively expensive programs that you just mentioned, like a UBI, which would pay more money to more people to stay home from work, even before jumping into any of that, the current spending levels are unaffordable for taxpayers. And that's why we're really pushing so hard to see these politicians rein in the borrowing and rein in the spending. Now, if there is a key point that I'd like to get across today, it's this. We, we all know that there was massive amounts of government government spending during COVID-19, but really the roots of this government spending problem were planted long before the pandemic. And there's three key points that I'd like to make to really illustrate that. The first one is that the, math, the, the vast majority of federal government spending, even last year during the pandemic, were on non-COVID-19 related budget items. Troy, you just pointed out that federal per person spending last year was seven thousand dollars That was from the Fraser Institute report, and I dove into that report a little bit deeper, and they also showed that nearly two-thirds of all of that spending was on non-pandemic-related spending. So we've seen so many households, so many businesses during downturns rein in their budgets on certain line items to find some savings, but what we've seen from the federal government is spend more on the pandemic, of course, but also spend more, it seems, on everything else. So that's point number one. Point number two is that we are going to be seeing higher levels of spending for years to come based on the last federal government's budget. So essentially what they've been doing is using COVID-19 as a cover to embark on their debt-fueled spending binge with absolutely no plans on how to pay for it. And now let me explain. We looked at the April budget that was released by Finance Minister Christia Freeland, and it turns out by 2026, the federal government will have increased permanent permanent federal government spending by $100 billion. So that is years after COVID-19 first touched down and huge amounts of spending on top of what the federal government was already spending. It's something that economists have termed the ratchet effect, where essentially you see government spending a ton of money, then a crisis or an issue like a pandemic comes along, they increase spending and spending never goes down to the normal levels. And Troy, with that, I'd like to kind of touch on my third and final Final point, and that's the federal government was already spending a massive amount of money before the pandemic. Troy, you touched on that per person number, which is the highest level of federal government spending in history, even inflation adjusted. Well, I hate to be the bearer of bad news today, but in 2018, before the pandemic, before a massive economic recession across Canada, the federal government was already spending all time highs which means before the pandemic, the Trudeau government was spending more than the federal government ever did during World War II. Now, with this massive amount of spending that I've kind of outlined here, you would think that there should be a bunch of places to actually find some savings in the federal government's budget. But unfortunately, we just saw a federal election where every single party leader it, seemed, it was almost seeming like they're doing their best, trying to turn a blind eye to all the waste in Ottawa. We know the NDP, they wanted to spend an extra $214 billion. They're living on some planet. It's not planet Earth, I, um, but the Liberals as well. Uh, they wanted to increase spending by $78 billion. And even the Conservatives, even the Conservatives wanted to increase federal government spending by about 50 billion dollars. So Troy, I'm glad you brought up the spending question. And I just want to recap, recap those three points. Even during COVID-19, most of the federal government spending is on non-pandemic related items. The second point is that we're getting ready to see massive increases in government spending for years to come. And that third and final point is that we already had spending at all time highs before the pandemic. Right. So we will come back before we get off here today to talking about some of the solutions, some of the areas we might cut spending in, because um, obviously those numbers that you're, you're sharing are very alarming. But let's just spend a minute while we have you here, Franco, to talk about 
Um, most of this spending, of course, is fueled by borrowing. Um, I want to recommend to all of the people uh, tuning in today, uh, debtclock.ca. Um, maybe uh, Franco or Zoe, someone put that into, in, into the chat. That's a mini site by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation that shows the debt going up, and you can also break it out uh, per, per your province. Of course, the finance minister, and she's not alone, there's a lot across the country that say that interest rates are so low, we can't afford not to invest or to spend the money right now. But what's happening quietly is that uh, in, uh, borrowing costs are starting to raise. So referencing our friends at the Fraser Institute, as you just did, Franco, borrowing costs by all levels of government, $54 billion annually. Break that out. Think about this, $148 million a day we're spending on interest payments right now. And if that's low, it makes me ask the question, what exactly is high? So talk a bit about debt. Um, how, how does it compare now to where it was in the past in the 1990s when I was <laughs> working at the CTF myself and how severe the problem is? Because um, there's a lot of different ways to measure debt, of course, and I think sometimes governments paper over um, and use measurements often more favorable to, to make it look not as, as serious or severe as it is. So talk a bit about, about debt and how it compares to where we've been in the past. Well, before I dive into the numbers, because I'm a geek, let me just tell you, let me paint you a little story that I think perfectly illustrates the situation that Canada's in. Now, Troy knows this. We, we have a debt clock. We always take it every year, it seems, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast, stopping in the big cities like Ottawa, Toronto, but also in the smaller communities. And this debt clock tour, we have this massive trailer that pulls around a clock to show Canadians in real time what the federal government debt is and how fast it's going up every single second. Now, we've had great success with this uh, debt tour, but Troy, we made one fundamental problem all the way back in the 90s. And the problem and the mistake that Troy made is that he <laughs> underestimated just how much politicians can spend when they're spending other people's money. Troy never, never foresaw that we would need 13 digits 13 digits to track the Trudeau government's debt. Um, so that was a mistake. Uh, in one year, the Trudeau government broke our debt clock because now the debt is over a trillion dollars. But uh, but don't worry, we do have that online clock, debtclock.ca. And we just bought a new and bigger truck to keep track of the federal government's debt. Uh, we hope to be rolling that out early spring before the next budget. So, so keep an eye out on that. Um, so I think that debt, that little story perfectly resembles kind of where the federal government's debt is in. Um, you know, I was just referencing the last budget that our finance minister laid down in April. Well, in the span of just six years, the federal government will nearly double the pre-pandemic debt. Absolutely mind-boggling. Um, if, you, if you break down the debt per person, each person on this chat now owes $30,000 in federal government debt alone. That's not even, that's even before talking about the provincial government debt. And Troy, you asked me to break down how we rank with other, with other countries. Well, the International Monetary Fund looked at just that. And if you look at gross debt to GDP, which is a measure of Canada's total indebtedness. Uh, they looked at 29 industrialized countries and Canada ranked fifth out of 29. But before you start patting uh, Trudeau on the back, that is not a list where you want to rank higher on because it means we have a higher debt to GDP. So we're actually near the bottom of the pack when it comes to our peers. And according to that IMF study, we are a 118% of debt to GDP. So you sell everything we make in the country over a year, you're still not paying off that debt. And, you know, I think it's, it's right to ask ourselves, as Canadians, where do we rank in terms of the 90s? Well, it depends on what province you're in. Newfoundland and Labrador is, uh, is not in a good spot. Their net debt to GDP is about 50% right now, and it's supposed to be growing and growing as they deal with more economic challenges. But just to put that into perspective, Newfoundland, about 50% of GDP is their net debt position. Well, Saskatchewan, when Saskatchewan hit its debt wall in the 90s, when it had to close 50 hospitals across that prairie province, its debt to GDP ratio was in the high 40s. And this is why the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, fundamentally, we disagree with the charge about interest rates being low because you want to make tough decisions today before tougher decisions are forced on you. And the perfect time to start paying down your debts is when interest rates um, are low. Now, I've got some more bad news for everyone on this call. 
I know I'm not the most fun person to hang around at parties, but here it is. So we looked into the numbers that the parliamentary budget officer put out. It's the government's independent budget watchdog. And they said, their number said that under the current trajectory of the federal government, we would not see a balanced federal budget until 2070. Five years of deficits. Now, it it's, doesn't mean that's what's going to happen, but it's a projection. Now, if that were to happen, the federal government would increase its debt by $2.7 trillion on top of what we're already in. And here's the scary part. We would lose out on $3.8 trillion just to service the government's debt. So that's trillions of dollars over the next decades that we couldn't put to healthcare, we couldn't put to roads, we couldn't keep in our pockets through lower taxes because that money would be going to the bond fund managers on Bay Street just to service the government debt. Now, earlier in this call, I talked about the federal per person debt being at $30,000. Well, under this trajectory by 2070, debt per person would balloon to $67,000 per Canadian. And I think that brings to mind what kind of Canada do we want to be leaving to our kids, our grandkids, the next generation. And that would be a massive government debt bill that we would be handing over to Canadian kids and grandkids. And you talked about interest rates earlier, Troy. One last thing, this, this dark and gloomy projection that the PBO is, is, is putting together that assumes that interest rates settle in at about 2.84%. Now that's higher than what it is today, but it is lower than it was during any single year between 1991 and 2014. So the question remains, what happens if interest rates spike? What happens if Canada stumbles into another economic downturn? I think we should all be asking ourselves based on that trajectory, will us Canadian taxpayers today ever see a debt-free Canada tomorrow? Of course, the other question is how many digits will you need on the deck clock in 2070? <laughs> yeah. I should put you oh, on the spot. Yeah. You should know it just like that. <laughs> still, thir still 13. <laughs> and we're okay? hoping to keep it there. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez, 20, 26 years I'm with the CTF and my legacy now is not putting enough numbers on the deck clock. I guess I'll have to live with that. Let's, um, let's switch to uh, uh, our friend Joe Oliver. Um, Joe, I wanted to ask you kind of a, a pragmatic question to, to start because I, I know you want to talk about some some of the energy sector and some other things in the economy, but maybe take us behind the scenes. I mean, you've served in, in cabinets. Um, often economic policy on the outside to us seems so incredibly haphazard. You know, help us understand a bit about what's involved with creating a budget or what would be involved with creating a big program like those that were seen during um, the period of the pan pandemic. I'm often curious, you know, who do ministers get advice from? Are there any limitations uh, on governments have in terms of the advice they get? Um, and, and of course, are any of these, these projects internally ever measured uh, or assessed as they go, as, as Jack talked about some of the, uh, the programs early into the pandemic? So maybe, maybe just a first question, take us behind the scenes a bit and, and shed some light on exactly what's going on here. Sure, very happy to do that, uh, Troy, and, and thank you for inviting me to this interesting and important uh, discussion about the parlous state of the economy and the irresponsible fiscal course the government has charted for uh, largely unsuspecting Canadians. The appropriate approach uh, to a budget is to start where you want to end up fiscally. And the clear goal of the, uh, the government of Prime Minister Harper uh, when I was finance minister, was to achieve balance. Um, and uh, we did that uh, with Canada's last balanced budget. And as long as the government is in power, the Liberal government, uh, it's going to be the last one for, for at least uh, 50 years, as, as Franco mentioned, and that according to the parliamentary budget officer. Our objective was not motivated by ideology. As you'll recall, Jim Flaherty had to cope with the biggest recession since the Great Depression, and he responded with, I think, needed and appropriate stimulus. But in a period of economic growth, it was important to eliminate the deficit. And that's the way to optimize uh, growth, reduce the need for tax hikes, avoid burdening our children with massive debt, and be resilient uh, in the face of inevitable economic downturns or external shocks. And that is precisely the opposite of what we're currently uh, confronting. 
after um, running a modest $10 billion deficit, the Liberals racked up nearly $100 billion before the pandemic hit and then uh, drove the federal debt to, to over, uh, I think it's $1.2 trillion now. Uh, furthermore, uh, the last uh, Liberal budget, and this is important, forecasted steady inflation and interest rates with no external shocks. Well, that turned out to be wrong in a matter of a few months uh, with potentially severe consequences. As I pinned, uh, penned, I should say, a while ago, predictable progressive profligacy presages prolonged pain. As Minister of Finance, I knew the numbers had to balance. So how to achieve it was, of course, the uh, overarching challenge. Uh, we started with certain givens uh, in terms of commitments and, and unavoidable expenditures. So the Prime Minister made known his views, and I consulted very broadly with the public, with constituents, special interest groups, NGOs, industry associations, our caucus, the opposition parties, and finance department officials. I also considered the views of my 16 member economic advisory council from across the country. And I should tell you these consultations were genuine and they were conducted in good faith. So the process was the department drew up uh, individual policies and the consequent fiscal impact of each one that had a chance to be included. Then we held numerous group meetings uh, with the PM, the PMO, the Privy Council Office, ministry officials, and political staff. And we, had, we held those group meetings very frequently. We were attuned to the immediate, intermediate, and longer term economic and fiscal consequences of each policy choice including their regional and, and socioeconomic impact. We were focused on the implications for economic growth, affordability, and uh, cost benefit analysis of each significant item. You know, you asked whether we, we measured things. Yeah, everything that was quantitatively measurable was measured and assessed. I should say that during this process, I was very popular uh, with caucus. Uh, after it was baked, uh, not so much, because I had to be Dr. No. Uh, the pressure could be intense. And I recall uh, Jim once saying he had just been hit by an ask uh, totaling $5 billion. And that was just from our caucus. Uh, by the way, that was when a billion dollars actually uh, meant something. Uh, there was no need for austerity uh, then or even now. However, fiscal responsibility and prudence are always needed, both in periods of growth and periods of economic downturn or, um, or intense challenge. Having a target to balance is critical because it provides discipline and we imposed a 5% penalty on cabinet minister's salaries if we fell out of balance unless the, the economy went into recession. And needless to say, that bit of restraint, as well as many others, didn't survive the change of government. Um, I think that, that sort of covers the question. I can, I can mention a couple of, or one policy question that we, we looked at just by way of example. Um, as you may recall, um, or as you may know, the, the, um, um, there is a capital gain exemption for, um, for charitable donations um, for uh, publicly uh, listed companies. And uh, we, uh, we extended that uh, to private companies and to real estate provided someone sold and, uh, and within a 30 day period, um, paid the money, uh, paid the money uh, to the charity in, in cash in that in that one month period to, to deal with the issue of, of evaluation. 
Um, that's another policy that didn't uh, survive the new government. But in looking at that, we looked at what the likely increase in charitable donations would be, what the cost to the government, um, to, to the fiscal uh, you know, framework would be, and um, whether we felt as, as a matter of equity and, and public policy that made sense. So that was just sort of one example of, of how you have to get into an extremely detailed um, analysis of, of, each, of each policy in terms of quantitative and qualitative analysis. Okay, um, let's talk, um, Joe, a bit about uh, the, pr the private sector now. It's not just taxes and spending. People still need to work. Income needs to be generated. Um, infrastructure needs to support economic activity. Businesses need to be profitable in order to create a tax base. Yet on this score, it appears the government is doing as much to dampen economic opportunity as it does to expand it. And this is probably the most clear when we look at the energy sector, uh, where it now seems that the government would rather import fossil fuels from the Middle East than allow an extremely successful and exemplary domestic industry to uh, succeed and thrive. So, so, so given all the challenges uh, that we face, does this make sense? What, what impact is it having? Um, especially on that particular sector, although you may want to talk about plastics and other sectors where in particular the environmental movements had a, a real dampening effect that the government's listening to in terms of put, putting a halt on a lot of that private important private sector development. Sure, look, the, the biggest self-inflicted damage to Canada's economy, to our national security and to national unity in my opinion, has been caused by hostile policies directed to the energy sector by the federal government, abetted by, by many of the provinces. I mean, think of what's at stake. Canada has the third largest oil reserves in the world and is the fourth largest producer. And let me quote from the prime minister at a speech he gave, um, I think it was in Houston about four years ago, he said, no country would find 173 billion barrels of oil in the ground and just leave it there. Well, that was then. Um, it was an aberration, presumably, because uh, his hostility has, has, has been manifest right from, right from the beginning. And by the way, he could have added uh, uh, mention of almost 1,400 trillion cubic feet of recoverable natural gas which is the fourth largest in the world and enough for 300 years at current production rates. Uh, the, the energy industry represents over 10% of Canada's economy. It creates about 830,000 direct and indirect jobs, including many held by indigenous people who account for about seven and a half percent of oil and gas employment. Also, oil and gas generate a quarter of our, of our exports. In spite of this, the, the, these numbers, in spite of this, this, this overwhelming importance, this government has been utterly committed to transition out of the industry, which is to say, obliterated. And the only issue is when. Um, this is not only disastrous for the economy, it's, it's also bad for the global effort to address climate change, ironically. Look, it's now become a given in, in polite circles and, and beyond that we must reach net zero emissions in 30 years. Now, RBC Economics did a study and they concluded that Canada will need to spend $2 trillion to achieve that illusory goal. Um, I don't think they're gonna get there, but, but there'll be great uh, pain inflicted in the attempt. And by the way, uh, to my knowledge, uh, that does not include the immense opportunity cost of not producing and exporting our oil and gas uh, to overseas markets, plus the 150 billion or so in canceled energy projects. Meanwhile, it's drill, baby drill in resource uh, rich countries, uh, including Norway. I just picked out as one example, because it prides itself on its eco consciousness and its uh, massive sovereign wealth fund won't invest any longer in fossil fuel companies. They've achieved what every limousine 
liberal cherishes, wealth and self-righteousness. Uh, without the, the, the slightest self-awareness of, of their profound uh, hypocrisy. Canada's uh, biggest contribution to reducing global emissions would be to develop its vast oil and gas reserves and export them overseas as a substitute for much higher emitting coal. Yet the, the Green Movement and, and the Liberal government are, are opposed, that, thus uh, exposing uh, their breathtaking hypocrisy of their devotion to, to, to fighting climate change. It, it seems that our personal scorecard is more important than that overarching objective. Uh, Canada, uh, as I think people know, uh, contributes less than 1.6% to global emissions. So there's nothing we can do that would make a measurable difference to global temperatures. Furthermore, we're more environmentally responsible than most other countries uh, that we're importing oil from, and we uh, continue to make a significant progress. Meanwhile, uh, the, the world is confronting an energy crisis with, with sky-high prices, uh, looming energy poverty, blackouts forecasted in, in uh, the UK and Germany, and a population which is becoming increasingly intolerant of the combination of, of inflation and unaffordable energy. Um, you know, the practical solutions to, to, uh, uh, to climate change are adaption, R&D, and moving from coal to natural gas. But ideological fervor has no real interest in practical solutions, nor um, any concern about the severe damage it's causing to economic growth and standard of living, especially for the for the least advantaged and that is in our country and in other wealthy countries as well as and, and more particularly in in developed countries uh, where where um, there are millions billions of people i should say without access to affordable energy or have insecure access and those countries uh, are not going to deprive their citizens of, of the opportunity to escape from dire poverty um, by, by listening to, uh, to a closeted elite that flies around in private planes and tells them uh, not, to, uh, not to help uh, their citizens who are most, most in need. Um, so I'm, as you can tell, really concerned about, about that issue, but it, it, it goes uh, beyond that. I'm not gonna discuss plastics, although most of the movies said plastics, my man, plastics. Uh, that's the future. Well, I'm not sure anymore. Uh, you know, what we have, let, let's, let's call it what it is. Uh, it, it's all sort of predictable. We have a, a socialist government, the most left wing in, in Canadian political history. And, and that means a bigger government, more spending, unprecedented debt, lower growth, high taxes, burgeoning inflation, and um, the deliberate attempt to uh, to eliminate the energy industry. And we've seen much of this before, and we know the result uh, will not be uh, pretty. I mean, the one thing that Franco didn't mention is, is the, the risk that at some point, um, the, the US uh, credit rating agencies will downgrade uh, Canada bonds. Uh, we, we've already had a downgrade from FITS, uh, 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 which um, we, uh, which has said uh, that uh, our numbers are are actually weaker than others uh, other countries that have the same lower uh, uh, rating and and so uh, you know that could that could uh, come at any time. Look, I'm not I'm not predicting an imminent uh, financial crisis, but I think it's it's coming and it may be sooner than we think if if inflation isn't as transitory as, as the central bankers um, think it is. And of course, one of the issues about, about inflation is, is psychology. Um, and if people think it's coming, well, it's, it's, it's coming. I mean, inflation has been caused by a supply chain backup, which is temporary, but also an increase, massive increase in money supply uh, caused by, by monetary policy, which is more long-term. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of what, how transitory it is, uh, 
the, the Secretary of the Treasury and the former head of the Fed, John Yellen, put a date on, on that of mid-2022. Uh, mid, uh, well, uh, that's a, way, a ways from, from now, and, and maybe she's right, or, or maybe it'll, it, it'll, uh, it'll take longer. So um, we've got a lot of uh, things to concern about, as well as the issues which, which Jack Mintz uh, mentioned that are you know, sort of more fundamental about our, our growth, uh, lack of productivity, uh, and, and the demographic challenge, which I don't think anyone mentioned, but we're all aware of. Okay. Um, thanks, Joe, for that <laughs> cheerful summary. <laughs> Um, look, you mentioned crisis, and I think, you know, I've got more questions written down than we have time for, but, but that's where I, I want to go next with the panel before we go to, to Colin, because I, I have read all of uh, Roger Douglas's books. He was the finance, labor finance minister in New Zealand in the 1980s that had to deal with a situation where they literally had a crisis. They went broke. They weren't able to borrow money. Uh, they had credit rating agencies, all these problems in New Zealand at the time. And given that there's an unwillingness to sort of change policy course with the current government and voters seem fairly content with this, with this direction, is that really what it takes? I mean, that's kind of what we faced in the 1990s. I well remember Franco talked about the debt clock when, when back in those days, Jason Kenney and I taking the debt clock around to, to various locations trying to get um, you know, people aware about the debt. Um, you know, we were facing a crisis situation with a lot of bond rating agencies and other things at that time in Canada. So I, I just want to do a round table with, with everyone here before we, we go back to Colin. Is that really what we're facing? Do we need to face downgrades? Do we need to have some sort of crisis before we really do see a change in policy in this country? And maybe since you haven't spoken for a while, Jack, we'll, we'll go back to you to deal, deal with that first. Well, unfortunately, yes. I mean, it's uh, in fact, we forget that 1994, we, we faced a crisis as a country because at that time, uh, Canada was going to have to go to the IMF in order to sell some bonds. And that's what happens when the market loses confidence uh, in your in your currency and in your um, and in your uh, you know in, in your in your bonds that you're trying to issue. And we have to remember Canada, when you actually look at the IMF statistics, uh, last time I looked, over 20% of Canadian government bonds are sold to, to non-residents. So, uh, and we also have a very short term structure. So we tend to go out to the market a lot every year in order to sell those bonds. And there is a point that resistance can, can build up where they feel uh, a government is not able to pay back uh, or cover the cost of those bonds. We're not at that point yet, but that can happen. I think the more uh, interesting crisis that could occur is this uh, high flying inflation rate, uh, which is now at 4.7% uh, in Canada and probably is gonna end up, I predicted even this year that it was gonna be close to 5% by the time we end the year. I said that a half a year ago, while the, while the Bank of Canada was still predicting, uh, you know, somewhere around two, two and a half percent inflation. So, uh, you know, uh, what's gonna happen in 2022, I'm not sure in 2023, but in my view is I think we are not, we are, you know, we are not necessarily gonna see transitory inflation. And when people are finding it really tough to, to pay for uh, food and transportation and housing and uh, et cetera, that, that, that starts getting people very uh, upset and angry. That inflation tax, by the way, uh, can be quite significant. And we have to remember that once prices go up, they don't go down. <laughs> and so we keep talking about inflation, but we also have to remember this price index that has gone up and everyone is feeling uh, much higher costs right now and businesses are facing costs and they know they're gonna have to pass those things on. And that, and that, I think, is going to uh, trigger, uh, I think, eventually a Bank of Canada response, which is going to be higher interest rates and a more contraction, contractionary uh, monetary policy. And if the federal government keeps with an expansionary fiscal policy, that's only going to aggravate the situation more, requiring a much bigger mo monetary policy response. So my, my main point is that we are going to move into a, uh, a much more serious situation uh, down the road. And if the Bank of Canada does accommodate uh, high inflation for a long period of time, we'll, we'll just get back to repeating uh, that period of the 1970s and 80s of large deficits, high inflation, and eventually much higher interest rates and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and the world, which gets uh, more nervous about holding Canadian bonds. All right. Um, Franco, I'm gonna come to you with that question as well, is it, do we need to have a crisis? And, 
I also want to ask too, because you know my backgrounds with with, with Canadian Taxpayers Federation as well. It just seems to me that in the 1990s there was so much more public interest in in this whole subject of fiscal mismanagement. I mean, we, we held rallies, we had thousands of people show up in in halls to complain about tax increases and getting the debt under control. I don't see that urgency there today, and yet obviously the problem is is as acute or certainly approaching as acute as it was then. So A, is it, is it going to take a crisis? And B, how, how, what do you find in the advocacy world in terms of the public taking notice of, of how bloody serious the situation is? Well, those are two great questions. Uh, first, A, is I don't have a crystal ball. I am not sure. I don't know. Um, but I will say one of the aims of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation is to push these politicians to, to speed up the tough decisions, right, before these massively tougher decisions are forced on us like they were in the 90s. So I think that is one of the key goals of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation right there is just speeding up the decision-making process from these politicians. Now, B, I wasn't really around in the 90s, so I, I didn't get to experience that firsthand. And Troy. But what I will say is this, I think people do care. I'm just going to push back a little bit. I think people do care. I think politicians don't want to talk about it because then they're going to have to take a good hard look in the mirror. I mean, just, just look, look at these gas prices that are surging. I care. My mother and I, we just had a conversation on the weekend talking about how we're getting gouged here at the gas pumps. Well, taxes make up 31 to 42% of the pump price, right? So for politicians to talk about these soaring gas prices, they would have to point the finger at themselves, right? We all know the Trudeau government's carbon taxes that have gone up twice during the pandemic, but even the opposition, how are they gonna hold Trudeau accountable on carbon taxes and gas prices when their own leader, O'Toole, wants a carbon tax of his own? Um, when we talk about this massive amount of spending, uh, I'm sure we all talk to, to everyday Canadians and they say, um, you know, we're worried about how we're going to pay back the massive increase in government spending. I hear that all the time. But it's tough to get a peep out of these politicians when these politicians from all parties don't even want to reverse the two pandemic pay raises that they gobbled up for themselves. Now, one thing I will say in terms of uh, the real public outcry, I think we're starting to see that with inflation. Inflation is showing us that there is no such thing as a free government lunch, right? The massive amount of money printing that we've seen from the Bank of Canada, the $370 billion that the Bank of Canada has printed during the pandemic, I think is, is really playing a factor there. So I'll just kind of end on this one. I think most people do care. And I think a lot of these politicians are really missing the mark on what they're choosing to focus on. I, I, hope, you're, I hope you're right, Franco. Um, I'm just watching time. So hopefully we'll we'll come we'll come back to you, Joe. Is that okay? Um, well, uh, okay. I I just like to, if if I could. Okay. Uh, there's a political dimension here, which which is which is pretty critical. Um, but it does the, the politics does relate to to what people are thinking, and and you know uh, d deficits and debt are not the flavor of the day at all. Um, and uh, you've got a government that's ideologically uh, totally unconcerned about it and wants you know, the great reset and bigger and bigger uh, uh, and a bigger government um, and is taking advantage, exploiting the, the, the pandemic uh, to achieve that, that, that purpose. As well, uh, opportunity costs are totally lost on most people. They don't feel it directly because they don't know what, how much better things would have been uh, had the opportunity costs not been incurred. But I do, I do agree with Franco that, that inflation is starting to 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 uh, get people's attention because it's hitting them in the pocket. I mean, 1.2 trillion made no difference to to the average Canadian's perception. An extra ten dollars at the pump, that's a big big deal. And so I, I think um, attitudes are 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 starting to change. But we're going to need, uh, if not a, a full blown crisis. Uh, a crisis environment to, to get a, a major uh, change in, in, uh, in the attitude uh, to, to fiscal responsibility. Okay. Colin, we're running out of time, but is there like yeah. the key question? Is there, is there a common sort of thread to what people have been talking about in the, in the chat and in the Q&A that we, we could put to our panel? Yeah, and inflation's a big one that uh, I keep seeing. And I'm just going to kind of condense it into a question. I think maybe Professor Mintz might uh, want to weigh in on this first. Um, and that is that if you if you go to your grocery store, local retail outlet, whatever, and you're seeing prices going up, 
How much of that do you think is due to problems with supply chains versus the government's uh, spending and monetary policy decisions? Um, well, I think it's a, it's a combination of both. Uh, the supply chain uh, issues, of course, is a problem. I mean, it does hold back supply. Uh, but I think we've had two different types of supply shortage problems. One is uh, related to the fact that goods are difficult to move uh, with various health lockdowns around the world and things like that. We've been getting pile up of boats at, at shores and, and non-delivery of goods or slow delivery of goods. And so that, that's one set of problems. But the other set of problems, of course, is, uh, is uh, the fact that we've had low capital investments and we've, have, we've had low product, uh, productive capacity built over the years. And so that's, that's another set of problems that, in terms of capacity. Uh, but also our labor supply has been uh, hit through the pandemic. We've had people who have retired earlier than expected and now we're getting labor shortages. And to the extent, and I don't see how labor unions and, and workers can sit back soon and just see 6% inflation or 5% inflation. And next year, when it comes to the next round of negotiations with their employers saying that we need to get some catch up here and, and we need to get higher uh, inflation uh, uh, increase, or increases just to uh, offset inflation. And so um, I think that uh, this is where uh, if monetary policy is accommodative and if the federal government keeps spending a lot of money uh, that uh, ends up pushing up the economy, creating more demand for goods and services, uh, then inflation where is going to get embedded into expectations. And we will see higher amounts of inflation that is going to be harder to bring down for the Bank of Canada. And what that means, of course, is potentially an even more restrictive monetary policy that could be quite harmful to the economy in terms of slowing it down, but at least trying to counter inflation. And that's what happens when you have fiscal policy out of sync with monetary policy. And at the same time, you have these various shortages where people are either not coming back to the workforce, not enough capital that's, uh, that's existing there, and continuing supply shortages that have been brought about by the pandemic. Okay. I've got one more, Troy. Can I uh, throw it out? Okay. It's got to be super um, quick because I got yeah, I'll, I'll make it quick. And if each respondent can make it quick, uh, Preston Manning wrote a book called Do Something. And uh, if he was in this chat room today, he'd ask each of you, what do you want attendees to do after hearing your comments today? What can, what can the average Joe do about uh, these problems? Actually, Colin, that was my, my closing question. Oh, okay, all right. Especially <laughs> if Preston's mind. on, he'll, I would get an email from him right after. Why didn't you ask that question? Um, <laughs> and I would say too, I would add to that, what's the most important policy prescription that we as a movement should, should be pushing out there when we're talking about this, when we're engaged in debate, when we're in what, you know, all the activities that, that we're involved with, the, the press, the policy agenda. So what can we do something and, and also what, what's the sort of the single most important priority in terms of what we should be pressing? Do you want to start with, with Joe? Okay, um, I, just to summarize it, I mean, I think we have to, the critical point is to, to enhance growth, uh, restrain, restrain uh, spending and facilitate uh, competitiveness. And on that latter point, uh, fiscal policy tax uh, taxes are, are a pretty uh, critical thing. And I worry very much about a formal or informal sort of alliance between the Liberals and the NDP where, where, where the, the NDP focus uh, is, is just on increasing uh, taxes and the so-called uh, soak the rich plans, which uh, are not gonna collect much, but could have a, a negative effect on, on competitiveness, affordability and, and competitiveness. So, so growth, uh, enhancing growth and, and, and restraining spending is critical. Okay. Franco. Perfect. Well, you know, uh, the old saying in a democracy policy is determined by those who participate. So one way that we like to push our Canadian Taxpayers Federation supporters uh, to take action is to, to continue to email your members of parliament 
phone your members of parliament, phone the ministers and, and really push them and give them an earful on the issues that you are worried about, such as in, on April 1st uh, next year, our MPs are going to pocket another pay raise. Well, before then, phone up your MP, tell them your story and tell them that there's no way they should be supporting that third pay raise during a pandemic. But in terms of the policy issues that I think are the most important for the, the movement, so to speak, is uh, inflation and debt and reining in the massive amount of government borrowing that is helping to fuel all the inflation we're seeing. Thanks, Franco. Uh, last, but not least, Jack. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to be short, but uh, I think the fundamental problem is uh, what do we really want government for? And how big do we need governments? You know, we forget that back in the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, governments were roughly 30% of GDP. Uh, today, actually, with, especially with the spending binges that we've seen recently, it's approaching more like 45% of GDP. The last time I looked, it was over 42% of GDP. We, we have an expanding growth by governments. Bureaucrats love it uh, because they get more programs. Politicians love it, whether the programs succeed or do anything, doesn't matter. They make the, they, they make the public happy, because, especially if they say that only the rich are gonna pay for the program. I think we need to complete. I think we need to really start looking, evaluate what do we want governments for. They do have an important role in certain things like healthcare, education, etc. But we really have to ask the question: How much government do we really need in in this country? And there are other countries where governments are not nearly as big as ours. There are some that are bigger than ours. Uh, but I think if we're going to really ask the question: How are we going to get more growth? And, more, and, uh, and, and not have such high taxes and reliance on high taxes, et cetera. The fundamental question is, what do we need government for? And, and where and how big do we need governments? And I think we need to have that debate. Very well put, Jack, to end our discussion. I wanna thank our panelists for an excellent uh, discussion and exchange today. Again, this exchange call will be posted on our website and YouTube page inside the next two hours. Uh, we've not sorted our final exchange call of 2021, but we will be back in December. So watch your inbox for that. A special thank you again today to our sponsor, the Modern Miracle Network. We are the Canada Strong and Free Network. If you appreciate and value the work we are doing, please consider a donation. Thank you to everyone for uh, joining us and we'll see you next month. Thank you. <laughs>